This podcast, I sit down with Jonathan Espinosa of the Baja Legal Group. We talk about real estate from a legal perspective. If you're a buyer, seller, developer, or investor, you're going to want to listen to this because we talk about subdivisions. We talk about a HEDO property. What's a HEDO property? Take a listen. Don, thanks for coming. Thank you, Nick. Uh, tell everyone a little bit about you and your company, Baja Legal. Sure. Uh, well, my name is Jonathan Espinosa. Um, um, I was uh, born and raised in Mexico City, where I study in one of the top five law schools, uh, Universidad Iberoamericana, also uh, known as Ibero. Um, I have more than 14 years of experience in law practice. Um, the journey includes so one year in Congress, one year in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then more than nine years with, with one of the finest legal minds in Mexico. Uh, in 2020, uh, when COVID arrives to our lives, I was like, okay, I need to make some change in my life. So um, I talked with my wife, with, with some friends, and we start uh, a, a business, a new business idea that was the Baja Legal Group. So in 2020, we moved from Mexico City uh, to Cabo to uh, found this new uh, law firm here, specialized uh, mainly in real estate. We also have other practice areas, but uh, our our main um, uh, area is the real estate. And you guys are based out of what area of the Baja? Uh, we have uh, all the Baja, actually. We have um, presence in La Paz, in Cabo, in, in all the East Cape, also in Todos Santos and all that area. And also in Loreto, you know, Loreto is a, a, an area that is growing up a lot. So we believe that it's like the, the, the next step in, in the real estate market. In your law firm, how many partners do you have? We are three partners mm -hmm. and we have uh, six associates. Okay. So the way you have it structured, are all of the partners and associates here in the Baja or are they in other parts of Mexico? No, all of them are here in the Baja. Okay. How many of those are from the Baja? We have uh, one, two partners, uh -huh. two partners and one associate. Okay, that's actually a rarity. A lot of, like yourself, are transplants, people that come from Mexico City, Guadalajara. Totally. And um, in the three years that you've been doing business here in the Baja, how have you seen law different here compared to mainland? Well, it's totally different. First of all, uh, I believe that this place is totally focused in the in the foreigner market. Mm -hmm. In in Mexico City, we have uh, a lot of foreigners, of course, a lot of investment coming from all around the world. Right. But we also have a lot of national markets. So uh, at the end, it's totally different because uh, you need to change a little bit your practice to be able to compete with a lot of the other law firms that only provide services to foreigners. Right. And number one is speaking English. Of course. <laughs> Did you learn English in the university or did you grow up speaking English? Well, uh, all my life in all the schools that I went, I have English lessons, you know, uh -huh. it's part of, 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 I believe, of our culture in, in private schools. Uh, but uh, until I uh, came to Cabo, I started uh, speaking like more frequently English because yeah. Mexico City was more uh, uh, some text and some emails, but not uh -huh. speaking a lot. Did you ever appear on the radio? You have a radio voice. Yes, here actually, yes. Yeah, yeah. Here in Cabo, I have been invited like five or six times. Well, you have a very deep, uh, recognizable voice for the radio. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go into some specifics that are challenges in our market and that you actually have experience, which is the subdivisions. Um, a lot of the property is owned by families and um, for generations, and they're big parcels, hundreds, if not thousands of acres or hectares. And the opportunity for investment has existed where we have um, people that are now wanting to sell or sell pieces of it. So enter subdivisions. Of so, course. so tell us about what you see in terms of recent challenges of subdivisions in the Baja? Well, first of all, I believe there is not a lot of information around, around what you could subdivide it because um, everyone understands the term subdivided, but no one knows actually what it is. 
So first of all, I believe it's it's important to understand that the subdivision is not the only way that you could split or, or divide a property in order to uh, individualize each of the lots or each of the parts mm -hmm. of, the, of the property. So uh, the subdivision is when uh, you um, split or subdivide in more than one piece, uh, a big parcel, a big lot, right. in, in uh, little or smaller lots. Uh, this allows you to uh, have different uh, real estate units that provide different type of services, different type of construction, and you could uh, uh, sell it in a separate way. You don't need to sell everything together. Yeah, a lot of our developers, there are some developers, that's all they do. They never truly develop and build houses or condominiums they take big parcels and they set aside residential lots or macro lots bigger lots for people that are developing finished product and when you go through that process if you're an owner of big parcels of land or you're thinking about buying big parcels of land to do that subdivision what do you need to take into account there's a lot of things uh, that you need to know First of all, the, the type of project or development that you want to have. Because uh, if you're planning to uh, have this big lot with some common areas, you don't need to subdivide, you need to incorporate a condo regime. But if you're not going to have any type of common areas, you're not, if you're not going to share anything, you're not going to be owner of specific areas, the best way is to divide the, the, the lot. So uh, first of all, you need to understand the type of, of lot that you have. We have the PDU that is like the, the, the regulation around what you could build in some specific areas around the Baja. We have one specific for Gabo, one specific for Todos Santos. We have one, another specific for all the Escape area that is not so big, but we have one there. We have a one specific for only the Tesal area because, you know, it's having a lot of, of development right now there. So uh, you need to understand what type of, of lot do you have according to the PDU mm -hmm. and to, to understand the restrictions or limits that you will have. There are some uh, restrictions around the size of the area that you could divide. You could not have subdivisions in, in really small uh, uh, places or really small lots. So you need to understand all these limits. Also, you need to know that the, the, the subdivision must be authorized by the government. Mm -hmm. And that means that, that they will review all your projects. Okay. That means services, that means roads, mm -hmm. access. Uh, um, also the, the density that the, that area could have right. or that already have. So there are a lot of, of, of requirements that you need to present in order to have the approval for the, from the authority. How often are the PDUs updated? Uh, not really often. Right now uh, we are in the middle of the third one of the, of the PDU that we uh, uh, have right now. Um, in what area? In, in Oscawa, sorry. In okay. Oscawa. Uh, we are working in the in the third one. It's going to uh, be published this year, I believe, in one or two more months. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the third one in this PDU. Okay. Before this PDU, the 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 um, the previous one was not like like this general program to develop the area because that this area wasn't the same that we have right now. You know, so that's why uh, this is something kind of new. Uh, regarding to the the south area, this. Uh, this PDU is part of the general PDU of Los Cabos, but it has a specific restriction, specific uh, regulations, because they are growing everything really, really fast. You know? Do you know when the last El Tesal PDU change was? Mm, I don't have the, the date, but uh, I believe it was two years ago, okay. more than that. And do you know of uh, a new PDU coming out, or that two years... It's probably not going to be for a number of years. A new one is proposed. The new PDU that is going to uh, uh, be published this year, I believe also includes the Tesal area. Okay. Because a lot of people are saying that with the growth, the infrastructure is not no. able to handle. There's too much traffic, the drainage, the water, um, both for the house. And when it rains, where the water goes is a real problem. And... The PDU is supposed to address a lot of those kind of issues. And another issue is people building projects that are blocking other projects' views. Are you seeing the government doing any special things to address that? I believe the PDU have different ways to, to, to see it. First of all is the economic factor. 
the PDU is also regulating the way that the economies around development mm -hmm. are going to uh, help cabo in the future. You know, it's really important for us as 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 um, as cabo people to have the enough uh, infrastructure, but also to have a really good economic right. to to keep living here. You know, so uh, the PDU have this economic factor, but also we, we have the other factor that most uh, uh, people is willing to have a better one. Why? Because we don't have the enough infrastructure, not only water and electricity goals is a problem. Sure. We don't have the, the, the enough streets. We don't have a lot of things here in, in El Cabo. So, so basically we have these two points of view around, uh, around the PDU, the economic one and the infrastructure one. And this one, in my opinion, the new one is not going to be so good. It's, it's actually uh, giving more density to a lot of areas around Cabo. Yeah. So this is going this is going to allow more floors, yeah. more the condos, more everything. And the trend is people get frustrated with that and they start pushing out into the areas that you mentioned earlier, Todos Santos, the East Cape, even as far as Loreto. Yes. Um, and talking about those areas, you said those are different PDUs altogether. Yes, well, uh, uh, we need to remember that uh, Todos Santos area is part of La Paz municipality, but in the East Cape we have one part of is part of Los Cabos, so one part includes it's included in the PDU that we have here, right. but the other area it's it's part of La Paz, so they have a, a different uh, regulation around that area. La Rivera, uh, it's real popular in the East Cape. Yes, that is a part of Los Cabos or it's La Paz. Los Cabos. And I know there's a. On the beach in Los Bariles, there's actually yes. past here exactly. is Cabo, past here is La Paz, and exactly. it's a big difference. Totally. Um, time to get approvals, um, what the regulations are. What do you see in terms of trends in the East Cape, in the La Paz community, or I, the PDU? I believe that uh, the PDU in that area is not uh, changing a lot mm -hmm. because we don't have right now any type of, of, of uh, we don't need more than what we have right now. But I believe that the next specific regulation around the PDU will be that area. Because as you say, everything is changing here. So a lot of people is moving there. Right. And what about on the Pacific side? At what point does it become La Paz and no longer Cabo? I don't know exactly the community that uh, have this is a limit, but is before uh, Cerritos and all right. that, that Todos Santos area. So probably the Migrino area. Migrino area is still uh, being uh, Cabo, I believe mm -hmm. it's between Migrino and, and uh, Elias Calles. I okay. Is the next one. And I know there was a proposed PDU that had been sent out last year on that side, and it was crazy. I mean, a lot of the things, what they were going to permit, like much smaller lots, much more density, and you can definitely see the influence of the economic side of things. But if we see it here in Cabo, if you don't, you know, balance the two, you're going to be with a lot of chaos. And then it's a bigger problem to resolve. Totally. So what are some of the things I, I understand? You go to the PDU first when it's a big piece of land to see what's permitted in terms of the density, the number of levels. But sometimes... There's inconsistencies with that, that that is, you should hire an attorney to further evaluate it. I mean, is that what you're yes, suggesting? Actually, it's really common. Um, our clients uh, hire us before present any um, request to the authority mm. to know if they are going to be able to have the authorization or not from them, the yeah. approval of them. So uh, yes, um, I believe it's not a really easy document to read not really clear and it's huge. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy to take it and, oh, let's see what can I build here? You know, it's, it's more complicated than that. Right. So uh, yes, we have a, a, a lot of clients that hire us for that. Um, if the PDU is not clear, the good thing about that is that like the Santa Claus list, you could request as much as you believe you have according to the PDU and sometimes they are going to approve it. If not, if you find enough argues in the PDU, you could fight for it. Fight for it. Right. So at the end, that part is not so bad. The only problem is when you have uh, some areas that are not part of the PDU. Because in that case, you need to go to the Cabildo Municipal mm -hmm. and well negotiate the the land of use that you could have there. Okay. 
So I could see it very clear. If you're an investor or a developer looking to acquire a parcel, that should be a part of your due diligence before totally. you actually go through with the purchase. Totally. And, and so um, that's a great pointer. And if you're an investor or a developer, make sure to contact Jonathan and his firm or like firms that have the experience doing that as a part of your due diligence. What would you say is a reasonable amount of time to do that due diligence? Uh, it's a difficult question. Uh, at least we need two weeks once we have all the documents. Okay. Yeah. And that's the key is yeah. getting, and documents are very hard to come by with Sometimes. a lot of the property owners. Totally. And then you start seeing weird things with them granting certain parts of the land, different ownerships, selling, and exactly the skeletons in the closet. Yes, it's not really easy to find. And it's more difficult when you are going to work with the documents uh, of the family that owns everything. Because normally these documents have more than 100 years. So right, it's right. Easy. Um, do you ever get involved with a Hito property? Yes. Um, a Hito is part of, of our culture. So uh, every property, private property that we have, it used to be a hito. For those that don't know, what is an ejido property? Well, um, in an easy way to 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 explain this, the the hito is a, a different type of property that you don't you don't own as a private property, but you have the permanent uh, right to use it. So you could use it uh, mainly for uh, uh, your own use, not for a commercial use or for uh, um, yes, to, to, to speculate with it. Like you're not going to do a development on no. the Hido. Yeah. No. The, the, um, working with a Hido is, it's common here because a lot of our clients, um, want to be out of the, of the density of the, of the city. So they go out, uh, from the, from these, uh, populations, Los Santos, uh, uh, Cabo, um, La Rivera, I don't know. And they find a uh, really good, uh, lots. But they are a hero. The problem with a hero is that uh, it's not possible to incorporate a fideicomiso, like a trust. So you need to be Mexican to be part of the hero. And then you could buy it, the hero lot or the hero parcel. Mm -hmm. But there's a process where I've heard it since the very first uh, year that I entered the real estate market here years ago, that there's a process to take a hero land and turn it into private property with an actual deed and that process are you familiar with that how long does it take how difficult is it it's it's difficult it takes a little bit maybe no less than one year uh -huh. you need to uh have a lot of documents prove that uh, right now you could obtain the domain of the of the of the heater that that's like the correct way to talk about the heaters to, to right. obtain this 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 part of the of the right of the of being an owner, um, it takes at least one year. Um, this uh, authority, the federal authority, is not a local authority. You need to go with the with the uh, the run that is like the public register, but for a hero land. Mm -hmm. um, and this process take a little bit. Well, I think that it's important to know that also the owners of a hero property or the the persons that can use the property for generations. Typically, we're talking dozens of owners and families. So it ends up becoming uh, a big mess in terms of organizing all the people. Just imagine a homeowner association of 200 condominiums, and that will get you thinking of what you're dealing with in trying to get everyone to agree to sell and a price, um, and then the legal process to make that happen. So I personally have never been a part of a property where it went hito, turning into private property that can then be sold. But I know it's been done a number of times. In fact, the whole El Tassal area yes. was once a hito. Yes, a huge ranch. <laughs> yeah. And so it was property that was given to the locals by the government. And that's why you're talking about the federal, it's a federal process. It's not a local process. Yes. Well, I believe the Tassal um, have a different process because first, uh, once it was a hero, then it goes to be a uh, um, public local property. And then this, the local government give to the locals this area. Okay. So we have like a middle process okay. between the hero and the and, and state that we have right now. 
Like there's a piece right by where the Sor- Soriana that's being built right next to the Costco. Yes. And that used to be a trailer park. Yes. And it's still abandoned, but that's a Hedo property. And really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that's, I mean, it's been presented many times. I've heard about it, but it's the same challenges. Yeah, the problem with, with, with a Hedo is that there are a lot of requirements that you need to have in order to start the process. And there's a lot of politics around yeah. the Hedo because, as you say, it's like a huge HOA. So you need to negotiate with a lot of people around the Hedo. And HOAs, they're usually, you can reach them. Like the Hedo, you don't necessarily know where everyone is. And, but what's important that a lot of people need to keep in mind is why, even if you're buying a property that's not a Hedo property that at one time was, is the um, derecho al tanto. Yes. Exactly. So can you talk about derecho al tanto, what that means and why it's important to have that inscribed on the title? Sure. Well, um, the hero is composed by uh, ejidatarios. Mm-hmm. That is like the, like the homeowners. So the ejidatarios, each of them have the derecho al tanto, like the first right of refusal to buy the other, uh, the, any other parcel of the same hero before anyone that is not part of the hero. Right. So if you're going to buy that, you need to be sure that your lawyer make the correct notice to all the Ejido members. So if there's anyone that want to, to buy the property, they will have the right before you. Correct. And if in the same circumstances. And it's a mess when that is not inscribed on the title and you're buying and I've seen issues where it's changed hands a couple of times without that derecho al tanto, the first right of refusal. And then the current buyer is like, well, what do I do? Yes. And so it's a, it's a much more complicated process at that point. Totally. It, it could uh, end in a null and void title. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if it's null and void, then the current owner is like, well, what? The reality is that the likelihood of a, a hero tario, someone, a member of the hero actually staking claim is probably... Zero to none. Yes. Right? So totally. that's the reality, but it could happen. Yes. And we have uh, uh, this uh, derecho al tanto in more than one scenario. It's not only for heroes. You could also find it in Loreto. Loreto used to that's be true. part of the of the, of, of the the uh, uh, this huge fideicomiso that Mexico government used to have to uh, uh, support the tourism around Mexico. On a tour. Exactly. Right. And there's also a derecho al tanto there. I didn't know that. Yeah. And also in, in all that area, you have a, a derecho al tanto. Pueblo Bonito have also derecho al tanto. Mm-hmm. The, the developer uh, state that uh, they have the right to buy before anyone else. That's the true. property if you want to resell it. Uh, because it's something that, that, that you could agree between parties, not only something that the government could state. We have different types of first right refusals. But yes, that's true because some developers put that clause in so that it maintains the value in the community. So if someone wants to do a fire sale and sell really low, the developer can buy it from the homeowner. Exactly. Actually, I've encountered that. That's that's true. Um, Jonathan, where do you see the market going in the next two to three years here in the bar? I believe uh, everything is changing this this year. Uh, the, the end of the last year shows that uh, COVID uh, market is over. So we are uh, having a new uh, market. It's, it's still going up, I believe. Not in the same uh, speed that it used to. Right. But I believe it's going to still going up. I believe that uh, uh, all the, the, the cost area, specific area, and also the, the East Cape is uh, going to uh, keep going up and up right. and up. Yeah. And I believe that uh, Loreto is going to have like like this uh, new uh, play in this game. There's a lot of new connectivity, flight connectivity between the United States and Loreto. So I believe that is going to increase a lot the the the, the number of, of of expats trying to move to Loreto. Actually, we I was just talking to one of our agents. They were searching this past week for a beachfront condominium, and they couldn't find it because of price. So they're now in Loreto. Now they're going to Loreto. They started here in Cabo. So we've done that a couple times already. And on top of that, the people that are actually looking in Loreto, because we have the project there in Danzante Bay, Monteraya. And so 
with the resort there, there's a natural over the last decade plus of people going to the area. But it's the new blood, the new people that have been coming to Cabo and don't know anything about Loretto, but realize, hey, I'm in Phoenix, I'm in LA, I'm in Calgary, Canada, and I have direct flights into Loretto. Yes. And prices are much cheaper. Totally. And and I believe like the, the weather there, it's amazing. If you're if you're planning to buy a property uh, as a second home for winter season, uh -huh. Loretto have the best weather in all Mexico. It's awesome. And I'm actually going to be going up in the next few weeks. Um, and we're, because you do business there, we do business there. I think we've done closings, real estate transactions in Loretto. And we're going to do a lot more with you and your firm. So I appreciate the service you provided to our company, our clients, and everyone, Jonathan Espinosa. So Baja Legal, if you want to get a hold of him, we'll include all of his contact details. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Nick. I thank you all the listeners. All right. And until the next one, bye for now. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nick Fong Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Ronaval Real Estate. And follow Nick on Instagram at Nick Fong underscore Ronaval. Ready to find your Baja dream home? Check out the latest property listings at ronaval.com or findmexicohouses.com. Hasta luego.